First Chapter Friday, All Your Twisted Secrets by Diana Urban. I spent the last hour wondering if I would die tonight. You can drop dead from a heart attack at 17, right? The prospect of tonight's dinner party made my heart ricochet off my ribcage so fiercely. I was convinced my days were numbered. What's so bad about a dinner party? Let's start with the fact that my boyfriend Robbie was also invited to this little shindig and we were on shaky ground. Our post-graduation plans were at odds, to say the least. And as senior year dwindled, the tension mounted. It didn't help that soon to be valedictorian Diego scored an invite too. Our friendship had recently morphed into something else, something that made my cheeks flush, my nerves tingle, and my heart swell like a submerged sponge. Putting the three of us in the same room could be catastrophic. If Robbie suspected I liked the class nerd, he'd introduce Diego to his fist in front of everyone. I had bigger issues with Robbie than another boy, but strike a match in a room doused with lighter fluid and you're bound to get burned. If I were even slightly capable of hiding my emotions, I might get through the night unscathed. Unfortunately, I'm a crap liar, so Splitsville with a side of bruising was basically inevitable. Yep, a heart attack was imminent. I just had to get tonight over with and everything would work out, hopefully. I cranked up the Harry Potter score in an attempt to quell my nerves <coughs> and ransack my wardrobe, quickly determining that everything I owned looked hideous. I could either go ultra casual or concert black or funeral chic as Sasha liked to call it. And either option was downright depressing. After most of my clothes were heaped into a pile on the floor, much to the delight of my cat mittens, who swiftly nestled in, I discovered an old emerald sequin number I wore to a piano recital years ago. The dress now ended well above my knees, but it was the only garment within reach that wasn't a complete waste of space. Amber, you look great, Mom said. You're only saying that because you're my mom. Don't get all self-deprecating on me. You look sophisticated, though that dress could stand to be a little longer. Is Robbie here yet? He was only 10 minutes late. I peered out the front door stained glass window, searching for his black SUV while fidgeting with my amethyst bracelet. You're not allowed to date till you're 47, Dad shouted from his office down the hall. Is this a bad time to point out that we've been dating for like a year? Just as I rattled off a text to Robbie, his headlights flooded the driveway. I dropped my phone into my purse and mom handed me a jacket and kissed my cheek before I could bolt out the door. Text me when you get there. God, mom, in a few months I'll be in college. Should I text you whenever I go anywhere then too? That'd be great, thanks for offering. Love you, bye. I called over my shoulder as I raced into the unseasonably muggy night. Robbie tossed his baseball mitt into the back seat. Hey, babe, 15 minutes late, Robbie. Really? I slammed the passenger door and clicked on my seatbelt in one fluid motion. Amber, chill. Practice went a little late. His go-to excuse. Besides, I had to stop at home to grab your present. My present? For, for what? Open it. He grinned, the corners of his gray eyes crinkling as dimples creased his cheek. Curious, I plunked open the red ribbon securing the small white box and found a charm bracelet inside. Several tiny silver music notes dangled from an amethyst beaded band. I thought it'd go with your other bracelet. My, he motioned to my grandmother's amethyst bracelet on my right wrist. But what's this for? What, I can't get something nice for my girl? His smile widened that infectious grin that always made me feel like I was somehow the brightest star in his sky. My music had been a sore point for us lately. Robbie wanted me to follow him in his baseball scholarship to Georgia Tech, as if ditching my dreams of studying music at USC or Berkeley wasn't that big a sacrifice. But you can play music anywhere, he'd insisted. A couple of months ago, we had a huge fight about it and he convinced me to apply to Georgia Tech suggesting we put off the discussion until I heard back from him. Then I got my acceptance letter. That's when I knew we were gonna break up. 
I might have fallen in love with Robbie, but I'd been in love with music for as long as I could remember. I couldn't let him tempt me into abandoning my dreams. Despite my resolve, I hadn't figured out how to break the news. As if on cue, he said, I know we haven't talked about school and stuff in a while. School and stuff. How neatly all of my musical ambitions could be packed into one word. Stuff. Have you heard from Georgia Tech yet? No, not yet. I was so pale, my own blood always ratted me out. My darkness was obscured by my flushed cheeks as I thought, liar. Well, it has to be soon. I want to be with you. Keeping one hand on the steering wheel, he entwined his fingers with mine. We can figure this out together. I love you, Amber. <sighs> me too. Oh God, what am I going to do? Ah, crap. I zipped my jacket under the seatbelt, just like washing a car, using a curling iron on my hair pretty much guaranteed rain, and it was raining. If we moved to California, I could single-handedly resolve the drought truck crisis. The corner of Robbie's mouth quirked up. It's only water. Explain that to my hair, would you? Hey, you look beautiful, hair included. Thanks. My cheeks flushed again. I shook away my anxiety and scanned the street for a parking spot. The Chesterfield was an upscale restaurant in the basement of an old warehouse converted into a high-end retail space. On the weekends, locals bustle, bustled around this area pretending they lived in a vibrant city when in reality, three square blocks constituted our entire downtown. Fortunately, it was Tuesday and there were plenty of spots around the corner. Once Robbie parked, I unclepped my seatbelt and bolted out the door. I held my hood over my head as I rounded the corner, careful to avoid any puddles. The sidewalk was deserted, except for two middle-aged women dashing to a nearby car under bit huge black umbrellas. I hustled down the steep steps to Chesterfield's front entrance without waiting for Robbie to catch up. God forbid he rushed to anything besides home plate. I shook the water from my jacket in front of the first podium, looked around, and noticed empty tables. The room was deserted. Are you sure this thing's at the Chesterfield? Yeah, look. I pointed to a sign taped to the host podium. Brewster Town Hall Scholarship event in the Winona room. This way. Where the hell is everybody? Probably in the Winona room where they're supposed to be. No, I mean everyone else. Come on, let's go. Sasha Harris and Diego Martin were already seated, laughing over some joke that must have had nothing to do with her perpetual need to want up him. Robbie coughed and Sasha paused mid chuckle, peeking around the back of her chair. Spotting me, her eyes lit up. Hey, lady, thank God you guys won this too. Otherwise, tonight would be such a drag. Sasha was everything everyone else wanted to be, cheer captain, drama club director, class president, and potential valedictorian. Sleep wasn't exactly in her vocabulary. In a bizarre twist of fate, she also happened to be my best friend at the moment. Getting to meet the mayor is kind of cool, though, I said. Is he here yet? She released Robbie from a hug. No, nope, not yet, but he's the opposite of cool. Just FYI. I mean, come on. Who grows up wanting to be mayor of Podunk? I ick. It's like an oven in here. Ugh, I know. Sasha flopped her hand like a fan. Come on, you're next to me. She pointed to the seat closest to the door. On my empty gold rimmed plate sat a place card for Miss Prescott, and hers had one for Miss Harris. Fancy. Strands of black hair fell over his forehead as I noticed Diego locking eyes with me. He held my gaze with his intense copper eyes as a smile slid onto his lips. Hi, Amber. My mind flashed back to a few weeks ago when those eyes were mere inches from mine. Let's face it, you could pretty much fry an egg on my face. Hi, congratulations. Let me guess, you won because of your music? I laughed nervously, fidgeting with the music note charms on my new bracelet. Yeah, Mr. Torrenti must have nominated me. 
I mean, I've basically been teaching his orchestra class for the last four years. I rambled. Oh, God, if Robbie caught wind of the weirdness between me and Diego, tonight would be a nightmare. Can you believe they'd give Diego one of the scholarships? Sasha whispered when Diego pulled out his phone. $20,000 must be chump change to him now. As if being ridiculously smart wasn't enough, Diego was sort of a celebrity in our school. He'd invented a weird sponge that changed colors when it got wet and was on the show Bed or Bust, a reality TV show where inventors try to win funding from wealthy entrepreneurs the summer before our freshman year. After getting bids from all the investors and securing a deal, he and his dad sold millions of sponge clowns. Well, he's probably going to be valedictorian, I whispered. Sasha tilted her head and grinned, though there was fire in her eyes. Not if I have anything to say about it. I can't get a signal in here, Robbie said. Is it just me or is it like 90 degrees? Yeah, it's hot, I said. Ugh, Sasha groaned, and I followed her gaze over my shoulder. Priya Gupta walked in, scanned the room, and visibly cringed. Saying that Priya used to be my best friend was an understatement. She'd been like a sister to me. She now avoided me. Hi, Priya, Sasha said in a sing-song voice. Hi, I smiled at her, but she wouldn't look at me. Congratulations. I had no idea you qualified for a scholarship, said Sasha. Priya was no valedictorian, but her grades were stellar. She quirked her eyebrow. Oh, you mean you cared who else would win? Sasha's smile faltered. What's that supposed to I elbowed Sasha, leave it. You don't want the scholarship people to hear you fighting. Sasha nodded and Priya made a noise and went back to scrutinizing her fingernails. Diego met my gaze again and my insides pulled into a puddle around my feet. Just then Robbie reached for my hand under the table and I jolted. <laughs> Didn't mean to scare you. His hand was cool despite the warmth of the room and he kissed my cheek as Diego watched. Oh, God, how was I going to get through the night? I'm starving. Ugh, I forgot to bring a granola bar, said Priya as she fished through her purse. Diego grabbed his backpack from the floor. I have a candy bar somewhere in here. You want it? No, no, it's fine. Thanks, though. As she eyed the ornate silver platters dotting the table, Scott Coleman, stoner extraordinaire, loped into the room wearing his standard outfit of a leather jacket, black t-shirt, torn jeans, topped off with a black beanie. What are you doing here, Sasha Gate? Same as the rest of you, methinks. He grinned at Priya, who offered a shy smile in return. No way, man, you won a scholarship Robbie scrunched his nose. <laughs> Seems so. Bullshit, said Robbie. And Sasha clucked her tongue. Wow, nobody was going to get along tonight, were they? Guys, be nice. Maybe he's a closet genius. Scott winked at me. Hey, Red, what's shaking? Bacon. This had been our customary greeting ever since we used to play together as kids, but we realized how little we had in common. I got this letter. It said to come here. So here I am. But how'd you qualify? Do you have some secret talent you've been hiding from us? Said Sasha, smiling sweetly. Nope. But who the hell cares? 20K is 20K. Besides, I had no plans tonight and I like free food. So no rind off my orange. Sasha cringed. That's not an expression. The massive oak door behind me slammed shut with a force that reverberated through my chest and the glasses in the china cabinets rattled. Everyone jumped and a few people gasped. Wind tunnel? I scooted my chair back and stood to open the door as thunder clapped outside. Oh, right. Robbie's shoulders relaxed. The storm. As I squeezed past Sasha, she tossed her hair back and focused on Scott again. Anyway, they don't just arbitrarily hand out $20,000. Like, Robbie has baseball, Amber's a music prodigy, and I'm the director of the drama club. There has to be some reason you won. Yeah? Well, I'm director of the Give Zero Beep 
club. Maybe that counts for something. Uh, guys, I think the door's stuck. Seriously? Priya glared at me like being trapped in a room together was her version of hell. You're just a little weakling, Robbie strutted over and gave me a playful shove. I am not, I muttered, returning to my seat. I fished my cell phone from my purse, no signal. As Robbie fought with the door, I scanned the table. Robbie cursed and gave the doorknob a final shake. Damn it, it really is stuck. I rolled my eyes. Told you. Crap, Sasha waved her phone above her head. I have no signal. Me neither, I said. I haven't had one since we got here. Robbie took out his phone and shook it like that would help. Same here, Priya chimed in. Well, the mayor's going to show up at some point, right? Asked Diego. Yep, he'll be here and he'll be able to help us out or get help or whatever. Shouldn't he be here by now? Sasha checked her watch. He's probably just running late, said Diego. Sasha eyed Robbie, who slammed his fist against the lock and jiggled the doorknob again. But what if he had to cancel? What if he tried calling to let us know but couldn't get through? What if no one's coming? Sasha, chill out, I said. If he couldn't get through, said Scott, his office would send some secretary here to tell us, right? Huh, weird, said Diego. Table set for six. Yeah, so? Diego and I exchanged a look. That's bizarre, I said. If the mayor's having dinner with us, why is the table only set for six? Are you saying nobody's coming to let us out? Sasha said an octave too high. Someone will be here to serve food and stuff, said Scott, a waiter or something. Looks like they already did. Diego motioned to the covered trays lining the table. But why would they serve dinner before we got here? Is it just me or is this kind of weird? Scott said as he lifted the lid on the tray closest to him. For once, it's not you, Robbie muttered, uncovering a salad platter. Well, Priya licked her lips, eyeing a bowl of roasted yams. We might as well eat, right? I guess so, I bit my lip. Robbie dropped the lid on the floor behind him. Whatever. Let's get this party started, shall we? Hmm, they got any booze in this joint? Yeah, but it's all at the bar out there, said Sasha, uncovering a platter of deviled eggs. Gross, how long have those been sitting out? I stood and lifted the lid from the biggest platter in the center of the table. Sasha and Priya both shrieked, making me almost drop the lid. My heart fell into my stomach as everyone gaped at the contents of the tray. A syringe, an envelope, and something that looked an awful lot like a bomb. What the actual bleep, said Robbie. A shiver coasted down my spine as I stared at the syringe. What the hell is that, that thing, Sasha cried. A couple of plastic canisters the size of milk cartons were strapped to half a dozen brown logs wired to a small digital clock and stack of batteries. Each canister was half full of some sort of yellow liquid. The clock faced the ceiling, its red numbers counting down from 5945, 5944, 5943, 5942. Looks like a bomb, said Robbie, clenching his jaw. I started the timer, I said to no one in particular. When I lifted the lid, I must have started the timer. That can't be real, said Priya. Can it? And what's with the syringe? It's labeled. Diego leaned over to read, botulinum toxin. Holy crap, he blanched. What's butyl, what's that, said Priya. She clutched his arm so hard her knuckles turned white. Diego kept reading. It says, warning, avoid contact with skin. A single drop can be fatal. Full injection causes immediate death. We all exchanged baffled expressions. What's in the envelope, asked Robbie. Nobody moved. I set the lid under the table and plucked the envelope from the tray, opened the flap, and pulled out a sheet of paper. Unfolding it, I cleared my throat and read aloud. Welcome to dinner, and again, congratulations on being selected. Now you must do the selecting. Within the hour, 
you must choose someone in this room to die. If you don't, everyone dies. This is the first chapter of All Your Twisted Secrets by Diana Urban. This book is available in your classroom library at the Quincy Public Library and also on Amazon for purchase. As the story continues, you go back and forth with flashbacks to a year ago and you find out why each one of the six kids were chosen to be in the basement of the Chesterfield and why there is the need for one of them to be put to death. There were times that the book was a little slow. I would have felt that it could have been uh, amped up a little bit and that it could, or that part of the story could have been left out. So I would give this story a four out of five for those certain areas. Because once you got started, though, you wouldn't want to put the, the book down because it was figuring out the relationship for all these kids and what they were to each other and why they were all together at this dinner. So again, this is All Your Twisted Secrets by Diana Urban, and it's available to read whenever you want to check it out.